Hi, welcome back. Last time we left off after seeing how we could use a shell application and we used the git commands that we uh, manage uh, to download on both a Windows and a Mac terminal. What we're going to see in the lecture today, um, we are going to set up an actual Apache, PHP and MySQL server on your local machines. Okay, and then we are going to learn what GitHub is and how we could interface with GitHub in order to um, keep a backup of uh, of the source files that we're uh, that we're working with and uh, to uh, uh, to to keep it uh, somewhere in the cloud in the GitHub service um, where uh, you know other people uh, can have access to uh, to the code if need be. So let's dig uh, into it. Uh, we, I am right now on the GitHub uh, calligraphy course uh, outline. Uh, from this point on, uh, I'm sure at this stage you know how to get uh, to the different lectures. The lectures we are going to be dealing with today is really lecture three, uh, and this is the reference for it. So if you click on it, you get all the instructions that you need in order for you to download. Uh, well, there are two parts really. First part is how to set up your environment by downloading an Apache, PHP, and MySQL server locally. And the second part is how we could uh, get to start using GitHub. All right, so let's uh, get started with the first part. We are uh, going to see together uh, the outcome of, uh, uh, of what happens when, uh, when an Apache, MySQL, and a PHP server are installed uh, on your machines. I'm going to briefly talk about each um, method of, um, of getting these servers, uh, whether on a Mac or, uh, or on a Windows, uh, and then I'll, uh, we'll, we'll see the result uh, together. Okay, I am definitely not uh, going to go through the process of downloading it on uh, on my machine um, because the instructions are quite clear and and the uh, and the process is really is really straightforward. Okay, I will, however, point out uh, the areas where you need to pay more attention while uh, you're installing and downloading the different packages. All right, so how can we get uh, a, an Apache, PHP, and MySQL server installed uh, on, on your machines? There are different ways to do it, okay? Um, if you read throughout the web, uh, you can uh, definitely download each and every one of those applications separately. So you can go to Apache, get the Apache server, you can go to the PHP uh, website, and you can download uh, the PHP interpreter. Uh, or server locally, and then you can go to MySQL and do and do the same thing. Um, but in, uh, uh, at some point, when uh, when you're installing and downloading all these pieces, at some point you will need to configure them in a way where they recognize each other and they can interface with each other, which can get a little bit uh, clumsy depending which operating system uh, you are using. Um, uh, so if you are on a Mac, depending on which version of the Mac you are on, this uh, the difficulty of this can uh, can vary, uh, and there's a lot of you know debugging uh, to be done uh, when when you're doing things separately. Luckily, there are some applications that get the entire package for you, okay, and they let you uh, just focus on what matters instead of uh, you know going through uh, downloading each and every piece together and linking them. It will do all that for you in a pre -packed. Packaged format. There are two packages uh, known, uh, I would say, or that are uh, quite uh, widespread uh, in, in the development world. There is one uh, application called MAMP, uh, which, uh, which stands for uh, really uh, Mac, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Okay, so it's a, it's a short uh, it's a short for uh, for that, and, and it's called MAMP. And MAMP is primarily for Mac. Okay, there is a package that you can download. You have the URL uh, linked directly from the reference page. So by clicking on the download map, you can uh, go ahead and, and install the server. So that's uh, one application. The other application, which is really uh, supposed to be cross-platform, uh, is XAMPP. Um, uh, so XAMPP, uh, you know, just like MAMP, exactly the same thing. It also gets you Apache, MySQL, and PHP, 
and it's supposed to be cross-platform, uh, we would recommend that you use it if you are on a Windows machine, okay? That doesn't mean that it doesn't work on a Mac. You can absolutely go ahead and download it for a Mac. But for as far as this course is concerned, we do have a recommendation and uh, we do advise you to get MAMP uh, for Mac uh, because it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty well packaged for, uh, for Mac users, okay? So if you are on a Windows, please go ahead and download the XAMPP. If you are on a, on a Mac, uh, please go ahead and download the MAMP. Great. Now, once you install um, install these, when you are doing it on a Mac, there is probably one thing that you need to uh, pay attention to while you're doing the down uh, the the installation. Once the installation is complete, there are two things that you need to be aware of. Okay, one of them is. Um, uh, you need to know at all times, and this will also apply to Windows users, you need to know at all times what your document root is. The document root is really going to be the folder that the Apache server is going to serve your files from. Okay, so it's uh, one part of your machine is going to be acting like a, a server that you can access from the browser, and uh, that folder is really always indicated by what we call the document root. So, uh, whenever you are uh, configuring MAMP or installing MAMP, uh, there is a document root that is defined to you by default uh, when, uh, to, you know, in, in the package itself. If you want to change that or if you want to know what that is, you can go uh, after you finish the installation to MAMP preferences and under web server, there's a section called web server in the menu. Uh, you can um, you can you can find uh, the document root in there. Keep that document root handy. You always need to know where it is. If you want to change it so that you remember where it is, uh, please go ahead and do for as long as uh, you make sure uh, that you are aware of its existence. A second uh, piece of information that is going to be uh, uh, needed uh, for either you to change or for you to to look at is the port number. Okay, uh, for both, there are two port numbers. There is one for the web server, which is the Apache server, and then there is another port for the MySQL server. These servers in the MAMP prepackaged uh, application, they might, um, uh, the web server might come as an 8080 port, so port 8080, and uh, uh, and the MySQL might come probably under uh, under either four or five or uh, another uh, another kind of port. Okay, we got to make sure that these ports are turned into what we call the default ports. The default ports are usually for web servers. It's port eighty eight zero, and for the MySQL, it's usually three three zero six. Okay, just make sure that when you are in the preferences screen. Of, uh, of the MAMP uh, to really uh, uh, go to the ports uh, tab. So there is a ports tab in there and there is a big button which you will not miss when you get there that says set web and MySQL servers to ports 80 and 3306. Make sure you hit that, okay? Now why do we want the port to be 80? Because when you are in the browser, usually you want to write a URL such as localhost and that's it, okay? In order for you to do that without uh, precising or defining what the port is, it needs to be the default port. So when you are doing HTTP semicolon slash slash localhost, it is, uh, the server is immediately understanding that, um, that it needs to append or it needs to listen to port 80. If it wasn't 80, and if you keep it as 80, 8080 or any other value that is given to you by default, then every time you enter localhost or any other URL in the browser, you need to put semicolon and, and, and specify what the port is. In order to avoid that you do that each and every time, it would be best if you use the default port 80. And it is the same thing for MySQL. In order to avoid using a port each and every time, if you use the default one, the server would recognize that. All right, so this is for MAMP. It may not, so uh, the, the, the content of it definitely uh, also applies to XAMPP. So you also need to make sure that your port, for XAMPP, are 
8.0 for the web server and then 33.06 for MySQL. But the example on Windows, it does come already prepackaged with those values. Okay, so I'm not worried that you might need to change them. Just verify and in case they aren't uh, 8.0 and 33.06, change them. But I am, uh, you know, probably 80% sure, if not more, that they come prepackaged as the uh, default uh, default value. Okay, so this is really uh, what uh, what you need to do to download uh, MAMP uh, on a Mac. On XAMPP uh, or on Windows, XAMPP is exactly the same thing. The the ports are already prepackaged for you. Just verify, uh, you know, what they are. And uh, also, please make sure to know where your document root is. By default, the installation folder uh, of the XAMPP for Windows is always uh, under your C root. Um, under a, a folder called XAMPP and your uh, document root always ends up wherever that XAMPP uh, default folder is slash htdocs. This is usually the root for XAMPP. You can uh, definitely change that if you want or you could always uh, you know remain and stay with the default and assume that uh, your uh, your files uh, and you, the, the application that you're developing always needs to be in the document root. So make sure you remember that. Once all of this is done, then you can say uh, that uh, you have uh, you have an Apache, MySQL, and a PHP server installed. Okay. The last step of verification for all this is if your servers run. In order to do this on whether you're an exam or on a map, on the dashboard itself, you need to make sure that you, the lights next to Apache server and next to MySQL server are green, or that the Apache server label and the MySQL server label are highlighted in green. Whichever uh, you know software you're using might have a different uh, you know uh, terminal. Uh, identification or representation um, so make sure that they are running and from the moment they are running then in that case uh, we are we are good to go for the next step now there is something that you need to know as well every time you change a configuration or in either the MAMP or the exam so even when you're changing the ports or if you're changing uh, the, the the document uh, route if you want uh, or any other configuration changes that you want to make you need to make sure that you are restarting your servers okay otherwise uh, the, these um, settings or configurations you do you did will not take effect you know, how do you restart same thing from your dashboard there is a way to quickly restart your web servers great so Assuming this has been done without any uh, any issue, and if you, you know fall uh, fall into some uh, some issues, uh, the documentation provides excellent uh, you know troubleshooting material. Uh, always refer to uh, to the to the URLs or to the links that are provided to you as additional references, which usually usually tend to take you directly to the source. So if you are downloading MAMP, it's going to take you directly to the MAMP. Um, website uh, and over there there is uh, very good documentation uh, or very good uh, you know um, FAQs for you to uh, figure out uh, and troubleshoot some of the problems that you may that you might have but overall in 90% of the cases it is uh, quite uh, straightforward okay um, now all this to say um, is uh, if you do not have a uh, PHP, MySQL, and an Apache server installed on your local machines, then definitely use one of these environments, either a MAMP or XAMPP. MAMP for Mac, XAMPP for Windows and others. If you already have an Apache server and a MySQL and a PHP, uh, we do not necessarily want you to change that. Keep doing it. Throughout the course, you might need to maybe activate some more packages in um, um, in your uh, in your configurations, but we will point them out as uh, as we go. Okay. So how do we test if the servers are functioning? And this is really uh, what we're gonna do. Uh, what we're gonna do together, at least as uh, as a first step. So let's go to the terminal. All right. If your servers are installed uh, pro properly, uh, whether the iPad, so the MAMP or the exam, ideally, ideally, you can start serving uh, from the document root. 
So any PHP file or HTML file that you end up putting in that folder can be read from your browser by uh, the right, typing the right address and we're gonna see that uh, together. Now my document root in my case is uh, under my home and under a folder called sites. Okay, this is where I put all the applications that I wanna serve by, um, by my uh, MEMP uh, in this particular case. So we're going to cre create a directory together, and we're going to call it test, okay? Or how about we call it lecture 3, okay? And then we're going to go to lecture 3. If you're not sure the, uh, uh, about the commands that I'm using, please refer back to lecture number 2. We talk about most of, uh, of the commands that I, I'll be using in here. So now under, under lecture 3, we're going to create a file, and we're going to create our first PHP file. So let's use the command touch my first page dot php and this is going to create a file an empty file called my first page dot php great let me check that it got created if i do ls i see my first page dot php now let's put some content in it and obviously the content that is going to go in it is going to be a php file so a php code in there uh, i'm going to use nano uh, for that uh, because i don't want us to start using editors yet uh, we'll do it directly from uh, from the command line. And in order to do this, there is an application called Nano, like we saw in the, in lecture number two. And Nano is uh, just uh, one of those uh, editors that comes uh, prepackaged with uh, with the terminal. So if I do Nano and then my first page .php, I get into my empty file. Now every PHP code, and we are gonna have a section dedicated for a PHP primer to get you, you know, uh, quickly up and running on how to code in PHP. Uh, but for the time being, just copy it the way I am doing it, or the way you know the instructions are doing it, and then you'll you'll know more about that uh, in in the next lectures. So every PHP code starts with a PHP tag, um, you know, question mark and a PHP tag, and it ends with a question mark. Uh, and an end tag, okay? This is to indicate to the server that the content of this is a, is a PHP, and then everything in here is uh, the PHP script itself. Great. So, now what do we want to do in that PHP? We want to print out, hello, this is my first application. There is a function or a method called echo, which really prints out to the screen directly um, the any string that you pass to it. So in this particular case, we want to do echo, this is my first web page. And every statement in uh, PHP ends with a semicolon. Okay? And this should do it. Ideally, now if I save, so I hit Control X on a Mac, and then I type a, a Y on, on my keyboard and enter. Ideally, uh, this is my saved file. Let's uh, just uh, show it out. Uh, by using the command cat just to make sure that it got saved properly and here we go so this is the content of the file echo this is my first uh, web page great so now how do we see this and how do we validate that our server is working in order for us to do that you need to open a new uh, browser browser tab and if you do http localhost without anything else this should take you to the document root um, base uh, base folder if it's empty, then it might uh, uh, it might not uh, show show anything. Um, and uh, if it's not empty and it has some stuff, and ideally both MAMP and XAMPP, whenever you uh, whenever you download them, uh, they put some uh, you know websites or uh, information uh, HTML or PHP within your folders. So you might get to um, a home. Um, which would say maybe it works or you know something else in the case of MAMP exam you might get to the MAMP exam dashboards okay um, you might uh, uh, in order to know exactly what MAMP and exam have um, in their uh, in their document routes just go to the document route by doing I think in the case of um, uh, MAMP it depends on where you specified it so if you uh, go uh, to to that directory um, where the document root is and you do an ls a listing in there 
you will see the full list of items uh, that it contains. And it usually has an index.php or an index.html. And this is really the file that will be served and that will be read when you type localhost. Okay, and whatever you see on the screen is really defined in that index.php or index.html. Great. Now, in our case, if you remember, we created a folder called lecture three. So right now, I am under sites, which is really my, uh, which is really the folder where most of my applications are. And if I do ls in there, most of them are directories. There are no files. There are no index files. So my local host will not be reading, uh, will not be reading necessarily um, anything. Okay. So I need uh, really uh, to specify that I want to read out of the lecture three folder. Now if I do this, of course nothing happens because I'm not reading a file yet. And my file is really called, if I look at it again, lecture three. If I look at my file, it's called myfirstpage.php. So I really have to say myfirstpage.php and press enter. And here we go. It just output it. This is my first web page, which is exactly the string that we typed into uh, into the file. All right. So hopefully this works for you. Uh, there is an entire you know assignment uh, further down uh, to validate all this. Um, and if you have any questions, if you have any concerns or anything uh, that you want to trouble troubleshoot, uh, we are always available um, to answer you. Uh, by either if you send us emails or if you use the the, the application so the Udemy uh, questions and answers uh, we are very responsive and we'll try to answer you as quick as we can great that ends our first part now let's let's look into the second part second part of this lecture there is something called composer composer is yet another application but what Composer does, it helps you package any application, any PHP application that you create in a way that can be uh, distributed to, um, to others, okay? It is nothing more, if I were to compare it to something equivalent, it's as if it's a zip compression, okay? There is, uh, is it any compression, zip or tar or, you know, what have you. So any compression mechanism, any compression application uh, packages, you know, everything uh, all together uh, in a way for you to be able to distribute it. Composer is the same thing, but it's meant for, you know, uh, not compressing per se, but rather, uh, you know, packaging an entire file structure of, uh, of an application into, uh, uh, into, uh, into a program that could be easily distributed. One of the biggest uh, benefit, benefits of Composer especially in an open source world, okay? What does open source world? It means that um, every code that you develop is available to anybody, okay? Anybody can download the source code. They can, you know, see the content of your files, make changes to them, and so on and so forth. So in an open source world, uh, we have a tendency to use from each other's codes, okay? So I could Potentially, if I don't want to, uh, or if somebody else created um, an interesting application that can do things that I want to do in my application, but I don't necessarily want to get into the mechanics of it, I just want to use it, then in that case, I would want to integrate that application into mine. Composer does a great, and we call that dependencies, okay? Uh, so dependencies are all those third-party applications, uh, whether they are paid or unpaid, that you might uh, that you might use within uh, your own application. Composer does a beautiful job at um, at linking all those interdependencies uh, together and uh, and packaging them in a way that when you download the package and when you unpack it, it will get all the dependencies for you as well. Okay, so this is what it is in gist. We're going to see it more when we uh, when we start looking into calligraphy um, in particular. Great. So how do we get Composer on a Mac and how do we get Composer on uh, Windows? In both cases, uh, you uh, need to download it from uh, uh, an external source, which is really the the website of uh, of Composer. 
Um, so in the case of Windows, the URL is given to you. You can go ahead, install it, um, and, and run it. Okay, there are no particular uh, configurations that need to be done. Ideally, this is a straightforward, uh, you know, process. From the moment you do it, it is done, and uh, and and you can be uh, you can be using it quickly. One thing that you need to pay attention to, if your terminal is already open, and uh, for Windows, if your commander is already open, just make sure to close commander entirely after you download Composer, and then you restart it. Otherwise, you might um, it might not recognize it. For the case of Mac, uh, there is uh, you can use curl. Uh, curl is a way uh, you know for you to uh, access um, access certain uh, web uh, websites directly from the command uh, terminal. And we are directly going to go to um, uh, to the installer uh, of Composer. So if you copy that command and you put it in your terminal, uh, ideally it should download uh, the file uh, the file for you. And uh, make sure you are um, in, in a recognizable uh, place uh, when you when you run that command. So if you want to run it from home, just make sure uh, that that you are in the home directory. If you want to do it in a particular directory, then make sure to create that directory to go to it by you know doing cd that directory and running that command from the directory itself. Okay. Why is that important? Because this is going to download a file for you whatever you run that command and that file is called composer.phar or composer.far okay composer.far is really uh, it's really a compressed version of a, of a php file in this particular case and uh, it's executable so what we want to do is we want to just um, um, rename that once uh, once you identify it and find it uh, in in your folder you want to rename it and the way to do a rename in um, in the terminal or in the command line is really to use a move function. So if you do sudo move this file into composer, uh, then you should be able to uh, to do it. And why do we do this? Because we don't want to type composer.phar every time we want to run this command. We uh, you know want it to be quicker than that. So by renaming it to composer, you will have that uh, possibility uh, to do, to do that. Great. So once you have Composer, how do you validate if it's if it's there? If you do Composer version, it and you get that, then in that case, Composer has been installed uh, properly on your machine. Okay, this is a way to validate it. Anything else that you get, which you know might be an error or uh, or you know some uh, some unidentifiable commands, uh, then in that case, uh, you need to revisit uh, the instructions and make sure that you uh, follow the installation process uh, properly. All right, with that said, that ends our second part. The third part is GitHub, all right? GitHub, we talked about it in lecture two a little bit. What is the connection between Git and GitHub? Git is, a set, is an application, it's a set of commands that allows you to, um, um, to track changes on your um, files and folders, okay? And it's mainly used from the terminal. GitHub is a service that is in the cloud that allows you to um, have a backup of any source code or any files that you have locally directly in the cloud. So all the git commands that you run can interface with a folder or a repository, this is how we call it, that is completely in the cloud. Okay. Now why do you want to put your code in the cloud? Again, back to the collaboration piece, if there are other people who might want to benefit or use your code, then in that case, by going to GitHub, they could have access to the full, um, to the full source code. Okay, this is why you most likely want to put um, your code in a public uh, or in, in a publicly accessible place. Of course, you can handle the permissions on that folder and not allow anybody, depending on what you want. But ideally, the the premise of having something in the cloud is really to be distributed in an uh, in an easier fashion without you having to you know send it by email or uh, you know some other mechanisms. Um, GitHub is a repository that is uh, always there. It is in the cloud. And your ability uh, to um, interface with it through Git makes sure that whatever is on GitHub is always the latest version 
uh, of the code that anybody would have access to. And every time anybody makes a change, anybody can make a change, by the way, and every time anybody makes a change, then in that case, they would converge all those changes back onto GitHub so that whenever another person or another coder comes into the game, they could always have access to the latest version. In the case of conflicts, which can happen very frequently if there are many people working on uh, on the same source code, then in that case, Git, uh, the Git commands that we saw last time would help you solve and merge um, some of these uh, conflicts. So, how do we set up GitHub? Uh, of course, if you are seeing this lecture, you you are either seeing it uh, in an unauthorized way, meaning you don't have an account and you're you're looking at it just um, by uh, by uh, you know by addressing uh, the URL uh, without being authenticated. Uh, what I am going to ask you to do for this course is to really to create a GitHub account. Okay, uh, so since you are on this page already, if you go to uh, to the top of it, you do a sign up. Um, in my case, I'm already signed in, but in your case, you'll have a sign up. So uh, sign up to the service, okay? You don't need to have a paid version of it. GitHub is free, and when it's free, everything that you do on it will be public, okay? This is probably the only um, caveat to the whole thing. Uh, but for the purposes of this course, I mean, you're not creating your application uh, necessarily in this course, so there's nothing to uh, proprietary really. Uh, most of the content of the course is public and is meant to be public, uh, so don't hesitate to create a public, full, uh, a public, uh, you know, uh, an account even if you're going to put some uh, uh, some of your own code in there, and your own code will be public, and that's more than okay. So you can uh, you know click on that link over here if you want to get um, access to the sign the registration page directly from there uh, you know fill up the information and then uh, once you're done you will be in uh, in the dashboard of your of your GitHub with which can look um, like this okay in my case you know I have a bunch of folders probably in your case you you might have uh, uh, it, it might be empty over here. So you might uh, once you um, you finish up your uh, your registration and you log in, you will end up on a page like uh, like this one. Actually, let's do back. Right. Now let's go back. Now there is something that you need to do um, on your machine in order to make sure that GitHub always recognizes it. Okay, why do we want to do this? So as I said earlier, we want to interface with GitHub through the Git commands. Okay. But you do not want to authenticate each and every time you type a command in Git. This can become, you know, very clumsy, especially if you are always doing it from the same machine over and over again. So what you need to do is you need to define a key on your local machine that identifies your machine and the user who is on your machine. Okay? And by having that key, okay, on your machine, you are then going to go to GitHub and in the GitHub settings, you're going to say that you're going to allow that key to interface with GitHub. By doing that, then you no longer need to authenticate each and every time you run a command from your terminal. And it would make things a lot easier. In order for you to create what we call a key, you, it needs to, it's called an SSH key, by the way. In order to do that, uh, I would, um, for both Mac and Windows, Follow the instructions. The, the instructions are very, very similar between Mac and, and Windows. There is, you know, one, uh, uh, almost one way of doing it, especially if you are using Commander, you know, there are slight variations just in the way we, uh, the home directories are called, but otherwise uh, the, the syntax of the command itself is, uh, is quite the same. So once you uh, do this and you type these, uh, you type these commands, uh, a key is going to be generated uh, for you. Okay, and once you have that key, now it's the time to go to GitHub and add that key. So how do we do this? When you go to GitHub, uh, and I'm going to open it in another browser, browser like this, we uh, we see it at uh, we see things at the same time. Okay, and I don't lose my lecture. So if you go to settings, under settings, there is a section called SSH and GPG keys. Uh, over here. In your case, it might be empty. In my case, you know, there's a bunch of keys. So what you need to do is you need to say, I want to add a new SSH key. Great. You can give it a title. The title can be anything that is an identifier for you. Okay. So it's not, it's not going to be used for anything else. 
but uh, for your own uh, your own purpose um, and it will be you know in the list uh, for you to identify now you need to uh, add in here the public key that is provided to you by uh, uh, after you've run the command of actually uh, generating a key so when you generate a key two things have been created for you on your local machine you are you have a public key and a private key okay so where do you get these these are usually after you are done with the with the generation they end up being here okay and you are gonna have something if you follow um, and sorry I may I may I might have missed that but when you are running these command the SSH commands over here um, take the default uh, so you're gonna be prompted to do several things uh, in the case of Mac if you keep entering enter 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 everywhere it will always take the default value so in in your case if you haven't used this before and you haven't generated a key before I would tell you use the default so keep pressing enter 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 until uh, until the end okay if you have done this before and you have already a key uh, you have two options either you don't create a key and you use the exact uh, the key that you have directly into the github or you create another key specifically for this course and for that you need to make sure to change the key name and not use the one by default okay if you are using the one by default the one by default is always named this way ID underscore RSA okay and there are two pieces to it there are two keys that are created in here if you look at my screen you have an ID underscore RSA with no extension and then you have the ID RSA dot uh, PUB which stands for public this is the key that needs to be put in github not the other one the other one is the private key okay you probably do not want to share this with anybody it needs to be local and only on your machine the public key is what you want to give uh, github so how do you get that uh, public key if you do cat ID underscore RSA dot pub you will get it printed printed out on the screen you will need to take everything uh, in this key so it usually starts with ssh dash rsa and it ends with the email address uh, that uh, that you put in your uh, uh, well, while you're installing okay it's going to prompt you to you know for your name your email address this you could do um, in in the command uh, directly in here so when you say ssh key gen rsa you're gonna put your email address over here so ideally ideally when you get to that stage uh, the key should be starting with an ssh dash rsa and it should end with the email that you um, uh, that you triggered uh, the uh, the command with okay uh, and you are gonna copy that and in order to copy that you're gonna do select it all and do command C in the case of the Mac in the case of the Windows you'll do control C and you can open either Microsoft Word or uh, or, or text or notepad uh, and you will need to copy it there before uh, you take it elsewhere this might be a little a tweak that you might need to do because you cannot directly copy from commander so you might need to do it uh, in, a, in a text um, in a notepad or in a text pad before all right, so when you copy this, now you go back to your GitHub and you enter the title, let's say test, okay? And then you, uh, you, you paste it in here, all right? And you do add SSH key. Once you do that, your SSH key will be added to this, uh, to this list in here, okay? And now you m kind of made a connection. Now you are telling GitHub that you are, uh, you are allowing anything that comes from that computer with that SSH key to uh, to use github and to interface with the repositories on on this account in particular Great now there is a way to test it. We will get to it uh, in a while What I want to point out is if you use multiple machines So you have a work a computer a home computer and things like that and you want to be able to use all these computers Then you need to create an SSH key for each and every machine where you intend uh, to use github, okay? Now, how do we validate that this uh, that, that that it's working? Okay, so how do we do it? There is an actually nice, um, which should be somewhere over here. This one over here, if you see it, as command. 
okay? If you do ssh-t, git at github.com, ideally, this is a way to tell us that we established a connection and it should return, uh, hello, your username, whatever your username is, uh, you have successfully authenticated. So I will show you, you know, how that look. I will just go back to my directory over here and I'm going to paste it. You can be in any directory, by the way, to do that. You do SSH, and it's going to tell me, hi, my username in this particular case, you've successfully authenticated, okay? Um, and, and so on and so forth. So don't uh, uh, copy that statement, and this is how you validate whether it's working or not. If you hit any permissions problems or things like that, I would suggest that you immediately go to the GitHub uh, troubleshooting section, okay? Uh, which is very, uh, very well written, or if you search in Google on why you have this, uh, sometimes it is a permission problem, so you got to make sure that your root is done under your user and not under, under root, okay? If it's, on, uh, if it's under root, if your key has been created under uh, the root uh, permissions, then in that case, GitHub might, um, might, not, might not like it, okay? So it might be uh, things related, related to that. I would advise you in that case to go and troubleshoot. Uh, the web is full of documentation around this, and I'm not worried that you would hit uh, that problem, okay? Um, if you are following the instructions in the course, I think you should be just okay. Now, let's go and create our first Git repository, and how do we do that? All right, so let's go back in here to the dashboard. All right, there is something on the left side called new Okay, and this would allow you to create a new directory on GitHub. You could also use the plus that is on the top right, and you can say new repository, whichever way. Okay, both of them are uh, okay, can do it for you. What we're going to do is we're going to create one particularly for this course, which I already have in my case, but I'm going to create a test folder. So we're going to create a test folder. You can give it any description that you want. Okay. Um, and it's an optional field. If you don't want to add anything, then you you, you don't. In your case, you uh, you you probably you don't get to choose if it's the free account, whether it's a public or a private. In my case, it's a paid account, so I have the option to make it private if I want to. Uh, but in this particular case, I'm going to create it as a public uh, as a public folder. Okay. Uh, now you get the chance to add a README immediately to to the folder. A README is usually and we'll get to it later, but it's usually one of those files that is read by programmers uh, from the moment they download any package. Okay. The README is more of an introduction. It's more uh, to describe uh, what the software is about, how to install it, what the dependencies are, and so on and so forth. Okay. At the stage of the game, uh, we don't necessarily need the README. If we need it, we'll add it later. It's not a big deal. It doesn't need to be done directly at this stage. So let's go ahead and create a repository. Great. And you get to this page. This page gives you all the possible ways on how you could get your files or any files that you create locally on your machine and you can get them to this repository. So right now we don't have anything on, on our machine. Actually, the only thing we have and that we created is our lecture three uh, examples. So if I go back here and I do lecture three, okay, it has my first page.php. Fine. All right, this is the only thing we created, but it's not what we want to necessarily upload to, to GitHub just yet. So what can we do now in order to get some code in there? If you look at the top over here, there is something, an address. Make sure that it's SSH address that we're using, okay? Not the HTTPS, let's use the SSH. If you copy that one over here, okay? by doing command C or by hitting that button in here. And you go back to your terminal, you go back to the document root, okay? And you say, I want to clone this empty folder. It's empty right now, but I still want to clone it. So I'm going to do git clone. And I'm going to copy that address. What this is telling the system, it's telling it go grab that repository called test and download it locally. Okay. Now, in order to be very specific on where you want to download it, because if you don't specify in which folder it's going to get downloaded, it's always going to uh, to call it the name of uh, the default name would be the name of the repository. So if I don't do anything in here and I hit tap enter right now, 
it's going to download it under a folder called test. But I don't want to download it under a folder called test. I want to download it under a folder called, uh, let's say, uh, lecture three first repo. Okay. So what it's going to do is it's going to download or clone that folder directly on my machine. So now if I do CD lecture three first repo, now I have it's an empty folder. Why? Because the one on Git is still empty. But I would like you to do ls-la. And notice how you have a hidden .git folder in there. What's in there is really uh, the, the configuration that will establish the connection between this folder and the folder on GitHub. Okay? So now, anything that I do locally will can impact the repository on GitHub. So let's go ahead and add a file in order for you to see how um, how we could uh, we could upload or uh, uh, synchronize what's on GitHub and what's on the local machine. So let's do touch and do uh, test dot. Uh, how about we call it readme? Okay, we'll readme um, dot txt for the time. Okay, and I'm going to do sudo, not sudo, sorry, nano, read me, text. And I'm going to say, hello, this is my first upload to GitHub. Okay, no code, nothing. It's just a regular text file. Now, what I want to do is do an ls. Okay, this is my file. I know that I have a file, and now I am in a situation where the two repositories are no longer synchronized. So, what happened on my local machine is not yet on GitHub, and GitHub is still empty. So, how do I synchronize the two? First thing you always want to do is check the status of your local um, directory. In order to do that, you do git space status. What git status is going to do is going to go and tell you you have some files that are untracked, so you made changes to this to these files locally, and they're different from what um, the GitHub has. Okay, so if you want to uh, synchronize, you will need to do two things. One, you need to commit first. What does commit mean? Well, first you need to add it before committing. Okay, first you need to add it to what we call staging. What does it mean to add to staging? Adding to staging means I am ready to commit this file, meaning I am ready to upload it. Okay, all the changes that I made, I am almost certain that uh, are final, and they're final in a way where I'm not intending to touch them in the near future, kind of thing. Okay, and those are changes that I definitely want to track. So what I want to do is I want to add this file. So I'm going to do git add readme.txt. Okay, so now if I do git status again, you will notice it became green. Okay, and it's saying that it is there, it is in staging because it's in green, but it's not yet committed. So if I do a refresh here, GitHub is not yet aware that there's been a change. This is only local, it's you add it in production in a staging phase where you are going to say that soon. I am going to transfer it to the folder. Great. Now, the immediate next step, and over here you might have a bunch of files, not just this one. You might want to add it to a stage where um, you always, every time you track, you need a time and you need a comment associated in order to tell all the others what the revision is on the changes that you made. In order to do that, you need to do what we call commit. What commit does, and I advise you usually to do dash a m, okay? D commit dash a would get would commit everything that is in green. Okay? Now in this case it's only one file. And when you add the m to it, means you want to add a message. Okay? So when you do git commit dash a m means commit everything and add a message. And in this message, we're going to say it's going to be my first commit. And notice 
how it uh, gave it a hash code over here to say okay uh, it's been uh, it's been kind of uh, it's been added so now if I do get status it's telling me now that my branch is up and my branch is slightly in advance to uh, whatever is uh, in the github now this is the first commit that we do the first commit always has a slightly different syntax than the rest of the commits the first commit the immediate next step is you need to push okay and you need to push what is in this origin folder to what we call the master branch in here okay and this is you only do it once the first time now I am actually pushing everything that I had in this folder okay onto github and if I refresh my page now I have my readme.txt alright so you only do it once this uh, this statement you always need to push but the syntax is different so I will do another example now to show you how uh, how you should uh, do it on a regular basis so let's now change our file again so let me go to nano and we're gonna do the readme again and we're gonna say I am adding a second change that is different from the initial commit and I'm gonna save it now we what we do we, what do we do the first as a first step get status it's in red obviously because I made changes to it what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add it oh I forgot the file name so if you uh, if you want to add everything you would do add space dot and it would add everything that's in red so if I do get add dot and back to status now my readme is in green which means it's in staging now I need to commit it so I do git commit dash am and let's we'll say this is my first official change it's been added great and committed great now I need to push so what you do if it's not the first time you do the commit you do git push dash dash all and it's gonna push everything that was committed and now it got pushed so if I go back here notice the timing here because the file is already there this says two minutes ago now if I refresh it says 29 seconds ago and if you see the comment in here it says this is my first official change so the comment is always associated uh, next to the last change that was made okay and if you look at the content of the file underneath now you see I am adding a second change that is different from that. so this is really how git and github interface together all right and this is what's kind of our last part and it's one of the most important parts really in the um, uh, in the installation of the environment because moving forward we're going to do a lot of those interactions with github in order for us to get calligraphy and the calligraphy framework locally uh, and then uh, in order to create our, uh, our our repositories with that um i am um I uh, I think we covered most of what's uh, of what's in there. If we go back to the lecture, you know, we describe what the add, the commit, the push are. Uh, there are some other uh, you know um, commands that can be used with Git. Uh, we will point them out uh, as we go and as we need them. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture, and I hope your environment works well. Um, there is an assignment. Uh, which you know uh, uh, we don't we don't necessarily expect you to uh, to deliver it uh, but if you want uh, you know I'll be more than glad to to, to look at it for you of course uh, but it's more for your proper uh, use and more to uh, to make sure that you've uh, that you've installed an environment properly uh, in your in your machine I would strongly advise you if you have not been following this course um, you know uh, or doing um, uh, uh, doing everything along uh, with with, the, with this video to follow uh, to follow the assignment and to get to a point where you have a MAMP or exam uh, installed that you have composer and that you have uh, a good proper usage of uh, of github with that uh, I wish you a fantastic day and I hope to see you next time